you, you teach as well, don't you? Uh, I taught for five years in a high school on now basis. With and totally recognized what you're saying. I just learned 99% statistics. It's an automatic trick at home. When you get to that level, you're really. All right, I'm already in trouble, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad. All wound up now. <laughs> I, I'm glad that I'm glad that we can have really good discussions. And I hope that that's what we do. Because I, like I said, I had a great discussion with a guy last night about arts and how do we educate people in the arts. So oh, that's where that all started. And that's that's my thing. I think we need to educate in all kinds of different things, and I think everybody agrees with that. The yeah, problem is how to figure out for it. how to figure out how to do it. <laughs> well, that's the problem what we're talking about. In any case, <laughs> let's talk about Mark. And I, I got way too many words of the day today. I don't know how that happened. I didn't mean to have so many words of the day, but I tried to pick some words that were very pertinent to exactly the what we're talking about, because with luck and, and uh, God willing, we'll be able to talk about the, uh, the uh, 5,000, feeding the 5,000. So these are all words that uh, the words that's that, where we're cranked you know, up on school about feeding the kids, feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000. <laughs> I we wondered need, where the tie in was. We need Jesus. No, no, I didn't bring that up. You did. That's your fault. <laughs> I actually, the paper did. Why does the paper need to talk about that when we got all kinds of This is going to come up again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> I, asked, uh, I, asked, I asked how come I didn't get my uh, eagle at all. And uh, I was told that it only was delivered to liberal. I thought so. you were already a colonel. You want another eagle? A double eagle? Anyway. Double bogey? Let's see, like a bogey. Um, C H O R T O. Quarto. Hey, where is that? This means, basically, it means a court. A court or a garden. So, quarto. That's pretty easy, right? That's almost English. That is English. It's the context is used is kind of funny that we'll see. But anyway, Carto, C H L O R O. Chloro. Quanto chloro. Which is really interesting because you know people say that Mark is not very sophisticated, but we find these words directly beside each other. Chloro quarto in description. Now, quarto means a garden or a court, but chloro is green. Is green. Yeah. Right. Like chlorophyll, right? That's, this green. is the chloro. This is where Clorox. Now, yeah, Clorox is green too, right? Yeah, you remember the, the song um, that we sang when we were kids. This word is really interesting. Okay. <laughs> Symposia. Symposia. All right. Now, okay. If, if you didn't believe, if you didn't imagine or believe or know or think that Mark was written to Gentiles and to Greeks and to Romans, then look at the words that are used here. Symposia is a, you know what symposia is, right? It is, it is a drinking party. That's where it comes from. Now, in the modern era, what's a symposium? Conference. Yeah, a conference. A symposium is a conference. You drink afterwards. So you drink afterwards. <laughs> well, the Greeks like to mix, mix it, right? In the Greek world, if you read my book, The Second Mission, I describe a couple of symposia. And the symposia, they got together, they recline, and they're drinking. And while they're drinking, they're discussing... All right. Well, philosophy mostly. They try to keep politics out of it. Although, in, in, if you read it, how much you've drunk. They, it depends on how much you've drunk. That's right. But they were really into philosophy, so the Greeks just talked about philosophy. You know, like what we were doing at the beginning of class, which is really cool. You know, no where is no drink? We need the drinks, right? See, that, that's what the Greeks would have said without drinks. So, a symposia. Though, think about this in a Greek worldview. When you are at a symposium, you are drunk, eating and drinking and talking about philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind as we get to that. Um, a n a k l i t h e n a i. Um, Anna, 
Anaclinia. Um, anaclino. Anaclino. To lean back, to lay back. Anaclino. Um, we kind of even can see, you know, clino, but this is to recline to eat, right? Um, and by the way, it's really interesting because I don't think we saw this word before, although they were inclined to eat all through Mark. They were inclined to eat like in a normal meal. But this is to recline to eat, just a very specific word. E, E P E T A is a Z, but we'll, it could be an S, E N, in e, epitazo, epitazo. Epitazo from epi and tasso to arrange. Tasso means to arrange, epi means to arrange very specifically. Epitasso is to arrange. This is one of those, the tasso words. Hupitasso, epitasso. Hupitasso, the world is arranged under Jesus, under God. Hupitasso. Mm -hmm. Epitasso means to arrange, like for example, a household or to arrange things. You're not under authority, but you are, are arranging in a specific way. Um, P-A-R-A-T-I-T-H-O-S-I-N. Para Tithosin. Para means near, right? Mm -hmm. Tithosin, themia. It's para tithemia. To near put alongside. So to near put alongside, to place something alongside. Um, I didn't go over what they're translating. You can read what they're translating yourself. This one is really, forget the E, but M-E, because that's just the, the declension of the word. I-S-E-N. Merisean. M-E-R-I-S-E-N is the declension. Um, merizo. To apportion. To distribute. To deal. Um, K-A-T-E-K-L-A-S-E-N. Kataklaesen. Catacleo, ca catacleo, from catacleo, literally to break down, to divide. And catatonic. Catatonic. Yeah. Not sure how that fits, but that's okay. E O G to break down. To break down. S. This <coughs> catatonic really isn't break down. Well, okay, catatonic. Oop. Really break down. E <laughs> not in. Precisely. Point. U logazin. U good. Mm. Logos. Logos. Well. Good. Good argument. argument. Good argument. We like to say good words, but a eulogy, right? Yeah. Eulogy. Usually when they give a eulogy, they say good words about you when you're dead, but you don't know it. You're dead. Well, I've already written mine. You've, you've already written yours? Yeah. They probably won't read it, so you'll be okay. It's boring. Believe me. You hope anyway, right? So let's look with these words are specifically come out of a couple of verses that I gave you, by the way, in the little synopsis part down at the bottom. But in any case, let's go back for a second in 30 to 630. At 6.30, the apostles, the apostolos, and, you know, that's delegates, basically. Uh, anyone can be an apostolos. You don't have to be somebody special, but we have this idea you have to be something special. But the apostles, and we don't know if they were just the 12 or what, but remember he had sent out the 12. So these are those that probably had been sent out, mostly. They gather around, we already talked about this, they gather around, get Jesus Sinago, he gather around, and they reported. And what's interesting is, it's the word is apelego, or apagelio, which means, apagelio means the news. They were sharing back the report of the good news of the gods that they had done, what they had done and taught. So, we, if you remember, this was last week, we said, okay, in 31, it says, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have a chance to eat, literally to have a good time and to eat. And so he said, he argued with them, let's go to a lonesome place, a quiet place, and get some rest. So in 32, and this is, I think, where we quit, 32. So they went by themselves in a pleon, in a boat, to an eremos, to a lonesome topos. And I didn't give you topos as a word of the day, but I think it's an important word to note. So here they are. Let's see. I got my maps, my pictures, my charts. Where are my charts? So here's the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> and 
there's like the river here, and then there's the Jordan River coming out here. You know, so this pins, pins that river. And here's Tiberias. And Nazareth is like over here, out kind of in the, it's not really a desert area. We, we have the wrong impression about these places, but they're like, this is like where all the farmland is. So there's huge farmland, Kansas. especially in this area. Kansas. Uh, it's better than Kansas. This is, this is alluvial, very alluvial. Uh, big uh, areas where they make, where they, food production areas. In fact, um, this is a Skidron plain. This is the plain of a Skidron. And if you read my books in Turin, you know the plain of a Skidron. This is the op this is the problem with protecting this area. In the plain of a Skidron, the problem with the plain of a Skidron is that it is a plain, an alluvial plain that's relatively flat. And all this other area right here, past Nazareth down here, is what. Yeah. Hilly. Hilly, yeah, not just hilly, it's mountainous. It's mountainous, and Jerusalem is mountainous. So Jerusalem, you know, in this area is mountainous, and all this is mountainous, and Jordan, the Jordan River goes down to, um, what's the city there? Um, um, Jericho. Jericho. And so, remember Jericho? It's a long climb up to Jerusalem, down to climb to Jerusalem. In seven miles, I think it gains, what, two or 3,000 feet or something like that? It, a very large altitude change. So this area right here is all mountainous, and the Escudron up to the Sea of Galilee in this area, this is all low. So in the past, this is the this is the battleground. Well, not yeah, just not just battleground, but this is the way that you attack Israel and you attack the Levant. Because down here it's dumb. You attack there, it's you can't bring chariots, you can't bring horses, you know, you can only bring, you know, uh, it's thin trails, things like that. And so if, if you're Red Centurion, you know that's where all the bad guys hang out, right? All the, all your, uh, your, your rebels and other things. And then after you get past the Jordan River in this area, it's what? It's plains again. It's plains. And this area, uh, depending, this is Kansas. Depending on how good the season is, you know, you get, it's just like Kansas. These are like the Colorado mountains, right? And all the, um, all the maritime weather comes across, and then you get this area in the plains is well watered, but the stuff after the mountains may or may not be well watered. Depends on the season, depends on, you know, the year, depends on a lot of things. So, highly unusual that, for example, there was a famine in Bethlehem. Mm. You wonder if that was politically a war driven. I think it might have been. Remember during Ruth? And then they went to this area where the Midianites were, which isn't necessarily well known for great food production, right? So anyway, but the big deal is that this, this whole plain is a flat area, and then you have Tiberias, and then you have the uh, Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater sea, lake. They call it a sea in the New Testament. But... If you're getting on your boats and you're near Tiberias or Capernaum, Capernaum's right up here at the top. Here's Capernaum, and here's Tiberias. And remember, they didn't want to be in Tiberias because it's built on, on um, tombs. And then this is the area of Gennesaret, right, where they went for the dem dem uh, demon-possessed guy that had the legion, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is the Decapolis. So the region, this region is all Herod's and the Galil. This is the Galil. Well, approximately how many miles between those dots? Approximately. Between the like of 26 miles around the lake. I clocked it on the odometer. Well, it's, it's probably about five, ten miles, something like that. In that, it's not, it's not a huge distance, you know. It's not, it's not like Kansas with haze, right? Do you have a picture? In cool. But in any case, so they get, we don't know exactly where they are, but remember they are in probably Capernaum. They could be near Tiberias, probably not in Tiberias because even Jesus wouldn't walk there, right? Maybe not. John went there. Was he forced? Did he go on his own? I don't know. But in any case, so they get on boats and they go to some lonesome place. Well, where's the lonesome place? Um, 
What's very interesting is the word that's used to describe that lonesome place is topos. T-O-P-O-S. T-O-P-O-S means both spot and scabbard. So, if you got your Google Maps and you went drilled down and you found some area of land that back at that period in you know the first century AD that looked like a scabbard, maybe that's the place. <coughs> when you say spot, like picnic spot, or well, spot like no, uh, spotted skin. No, topos means a place. Yeah, a place, a spot. So a lonesome. It's a lonesome place, but the word also, there's a couple of words I could choose instead of topos. I didn't have, to, topography, yep. right? The word topography. So, but topos means scabbard, also means scabbard. So did they go to a lonesome place called the scabbard? Or that looks like a scabbard? I don't know. How about this? What is a scabbard? A place for? A weapon. Holding up. Putting a weapon. So maybe the place was called Topos because it's where John went to refresh himself and prepare. Now we figuratively would say he was preparing himself for spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know nothing about spiritual warfare in this era. Mm -hmm. What would the Greeks say? We are going to prepare for real warfare. And John, remember, looked like a battle guy. And Jesus sent his guys out with sticks. And now he's going to a lonesome place called Scabbard. So I'm just giving you options. Does it look like a scabbard? Maybe it does. Maybe it's a place for preparation. However, we noted that in 34, in, in, uh, in 33, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns, the cities, literally the polis, and got there ahead of them. Now this is interesting in itself. Where did they come from? The towns that the Well, that's okay. Let's think about this. I think that's correct because remember, we the lo what is the logos to tell us that we are addressing here? The the first one is about family, right? Who is my family? Who who is part of my family? Who are my brothers and sisters? That was the original Logos to tell us address. But now the Logos of tel to tell us has changed, has not changed, but has become, has become, well, well, if you, if you piece this, right, if you are convinced, then you are part of the family. And Jesus found in his own land they weren't convinced, so therefore he sent his disciples out to convince them. Mm -hmm. So what we are looking at are the results. The, we are looking at the um, telos of this concept or idea of sending, pe sending out his disciples <coughs> to convince them, right? Mm -hmm. And I told you we're not, do we expect to hear the logos? No, but we will be shown the Logos. So we are seeing the results of that Logos. So what Ellen said is right on. The fact that they are coming from the Galil. But there was also another Logos of Pistis. What was the other Logos of Pistis? Who else went out and was convincing? John was convincing Herod. And we found out that Herod was, was he successful or not? Modestly so. Modestly, but is Herod coming? No. Probably not. Who was successful, though, before this? If you remember, think back. There was a synagogue ruler <coughs> whose daughter was literally brought back from the dead. And before that, there was a demonic guy, Legion, and where did he go? He went to the couplets, which is right here. 
okay? So it's not like it's just people in Capernaum or just people in Tiberias or just people in the Galil, right? Mm -hmm. The impression we get, and what did you say, 26 miles around for the whole of the kilometers around, okay? This ain't that big. Do it in 45 minutes. So they started going, and people are going, and, and are they going in boats? No. Now, they could. They could. They're moving. They could, but the, it doesn't say that. It says they're moving, right? And they're moving this way, and every time they see somebody, what are they doing? They're convinced, right? They're, they're convinced. Boy, you know, this is kind of cool. If, if you, okay, look, um, if, if you're um, Mick Jagger, and you're going to give a secret conference or have just a secret thing, and all of a sudden everybody from everywhere around is going there, right? I mean, Nick would be happy. He'd probably charge him money, right? But, but look at this. This Jesus guy, you know, who, who was nobody was convinced about in the Galil before, now the result is that all he d he's trying to go someplace to get the report. Why do you think, G okay, we, we, we might stick our little theological foot in here, but maybe not. Why do you think Jesus decided to go to a lonesome place to get the report? He thought his disciples needed rest. It was the Sabbath. He knew it was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen, right? Because this is the telos. The, the logos before was, they're not convinced. The author, Mark, wants to show you what? They are. And, you know, this is history. So it's not just Mark, you know, okay, let's look at the history. The history is Jesus decided to go to a lonesome place to get a report from his disciples, and guess what? Everybody shows up. So it's not too lonesome. It plus it's not too secret either. This cracks me up. So, you know, it shows a lot... Um, Okay, let's think of it this way. Let's say it is a lonesome place. Let's say it is one of John's secret hideouts. What does this obviously show? That it's planned. Oh, I was mistaken. <coughs> the people are bought in. In other words, okay, in a, in a secret group, in a secret clandestine group, right? Let's say you're partisans. Let's say you're all partisans and you're, and you're convinced about fighting your enemy, whoever it is, whatever your enemy is, right? And if I go to you and I say, if you're part of this partisan group, here's the secret codes. Here's the place. But I'm not going to give it to somebody who's not trustworthy, right? So the fact that the, all these guys are going to this secret place <laughs> means that they're all bought in. No, they're bought in. And, and you know, um, this is kind of like, okay, let's put it in the, in the pictures of the disciples. The disciples went out and they convinced people, right? Mm -hmm. And how many people did they convince? A few, and then they told somebody else. And somebody else told somebody else. Yeah. Well, well, how long? You know, we don't know how long they went out, but you know, it, it sounds like in time, maybe a month, maybe, let's say two months max, right? It's probably not three months. They probably would have said so, right? But he sent them out. Let's say he was sent out for a month. Well, how many houses and villages can you stay in in a month? Not that many, right? So the disciples come back, and, and they're going to tell Jesus. What are they going to tell Jesus? Jesus, we went in, and people welcomed us. People loved us, right? Mm -hmm. So how many people might you expect? Okay, so let's say you went there, and you stayed maybe a week, and you were there four days. So you got 12 disciples times four, 48 folks. So you would expect 48 families to come there, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. Those 48 did what? They told, they told, they told the other people. They let them in on the secret. They blab. Yeah, they blab. So, so here we're doing a secret society and a secret group that's supposed to be infiltrating. A mysterion that everybody knows about. It's, it's a mysterion that everybody knows about. Yeah. It's a mysterion that everybody knows about. What a secret. See this? That's what Christianity is. And remember, they don't, they don't consider themselves Christians. This is Teen Otis. Teen Otis is a mysterion that everybody knows about. I didn't put up Mysterion, I left it on your sheets, but that's why it's yeah, such an important point. The secret password is displayed up there on the billboard. Yeah, the secret password's on a billboard. Um, this also shows something else. You know, 
Well, I, you'd be disappointed if I didn't throw in. Uh, throw in. Go ahead. Throw, throw. I'm not so sure these people are all convinced. Because the disciples probably were only able to contact 48 families. These 48 families told 48 other people. And, of course, they couldn't tell it as well as the disciples. But they intrigued them enough that, hey, I want to go find out for myself. I they that. weren't convinced at the time they right. went. Because if they were, if they're all convinced, then what would be the purpose of the miracle of feeding them? Well, that is something we need to talk about. We'll get there. But, you know, what is the purpose of the miracle? Now, I think there's bunches of ways we can take this. I, I don't believe that Greek is not so concrete that we should make up too much. Okay? However, I'm going to go with this. You know, we can take the stance that, for example, they're not super convinced, but they, they want to know. That's okay. There's it's nothing wrong with that. It's enough to make a 20-mile trip or more. Yeah. We, we can also go from the standpoint that this is really a secret place. I mean, the Greek says it's a secret place, and most likely a secret place of John's, right? Because it says it's a lonesome place, and the description is really interesting because it calls it a scabbard. That's, that's the description. So, very militaristic in its description. But we also know that Jesus is surrounded. There's so many people in the place that Jesus is, right? That they can't hold a conversation or have a good meal. They can have a good time. So they can have a good time, right? But it's really important, you know, we can look at it either way. And, and I don't think we're doing any harm to what it says. But I think, it's, I think that when we look at it, we need to address both ends, kind of. And there's nothing wrong with both ends. You know what I'm saying? This could be everybody who's convinced are going there, or it could be that people who are not quite convinced are going there. Curious. 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 However, um, we can just leave it at that. You know, it could, it could be either way. You know, um, it could be that Jesus doesn't care that you know what the secret place is, right? <laughs> or it could be that he really does care. But this is... Anyway, to the disciples, is this expected or unexpected? Unexpected. It is absolutely, completely unexpected. They thought that they were going to a lonesome place to have a private, what do you call it? Um, symposium. A symposium, or, or yeah, symposium is a great word, or, or a, uh, an off-site. They're going to have an off-site with Jesus, right? And they're like, we're going to have an off-site with Jesus. We're going to have an off-site with Jesus. And guess what? It isn't an off-site with Jesus. It's like everybody's coming. It's like, you know, coming to the concert. It's like Woodstock. Yeah, like Woodstock. <laughs> like Woodstock. What is the song, Brother Love? This is really neat. In 34, when Jesus landed, and it's not landed, it's literally exochromite, when he came out, when he got out of the boat and saw a large crowd, he literally, it's splang kinozomai, which means his bowels moved. We don't think bowel movement is an appropriate thing, it's but gut feeling. it's your gut feeling. He had, you know, that Paul writes this, this is written a few times, other times, but okay, let's talk about this, because this is kind of an interesting thing. Cardia, cardia is the, heart, the, the center of what? No. Emotion. Of your emotions, but Greeks believe that your emotions were caused by sarx, uh, sarx, um, suke, and pneuma. So cardia comes from comes from where? Suke. Thoughts. Thoughts. Uh -huh. The Greeks believed that you had to, to have, like for example, love, mm -hmm. in their sense, it is totally a, a concept of thoughts. In, in love, in their sense, I mean the loves that are thought. The pathos, pathos. All right, let's talk about that. If I, okay, here's my bowels, right? Where does the bowels come from? Where does the bowel feelings come from? Sarks. 
starts. Pathos is totally a bowels thing because pathos means that you have uncontrollable lust or desire for a person. This is pathos. On the other hand, eros is what? Eros is romantic love in Greek. So that comes from cardia. Right? In, in other words, okay, with cardia... I think about how much I love you. I fall in love with you because I think about how much I love you, right? And then my heart beats faster because why? I'm thinking about you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I have a pathos moment, it's purely a lustful moment where thoughts don't come into it. Now, what's it, and, and why this is important is because this gives us an idea. It says that Jesus... When Jesus saw them, it was a gut reaction. It wasn't a thought reaction. Now, Jesus may have totally known what was going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Merrick, he did know what was going to happen. So he knew, cardio-wise, he knew that when they went there, there would be all these people there, right? Mm -hmm. However, when he saw them, he was moved physically. Why? And this is really important because this is this is the el absolute elements of the differences in Greek thought and English thought and the kind of thinking that we think, right? Why, why do we think the way that we think? Because we are Greek thinkers steeped in Christianity. In Christianity, we are taught, I think most rightly, although we're not seem to be teaching the next generations as well, that... What do you do before you allow your physical... If you have a physical emotion, what do you do before you do anything about it? You think. That's what the whole point of Paul is. That before you act, you think. That's why I taught my children. You know, Before you do anything, think about it. Right? So, Jesus has this feeling on them because they are like... And the word is probaton. I didn't give you the word A. Probaton is literally something that walks forward on four legs. So a quadruped. But it means a sheep. So like, well, if you want to be very specific and literal, okay, it is, they, they were like quadrupeds. Okay? Quadrupeds. Being led by their... without a peelman, literally a shepherd, mm -hmm. literally a shepherd. So he began to didasco, to teach. What is Jesus teaching always? Now, we, we don't know it from Mark as well, but we know it from Matthew. Remember when we did study Matthew? What were we going to say? What was, what's his teaching? I am the way. Kingdom. No, that's not Jesus teaching at all. Oh, the kingdom of God is next to that's, that's his message, is the kingdom of God is near. Actually, the kingdom of God is here, therefore repent, right? What is his overall didasco? His teaching, not his message. He heralds his, his thing. But if you remember from Matthew, what is his teaching? It's okay. In other words, before you act, think. Remember, before you go and take your sacrifice, do what? Be reconciled with your brother. Right? Before you do this, before you do that, think, think, think. His message is specific, is always on, on this line. So, so because they are without a shepherd, because they are basically, and this would go to what you said. You know, you said maybe they're seeking, Right? Maybe they don't fully understand. Or maybe this. Think of this. If I'm convinced, what does that mean ultimately? If I'm convinced, what does that mean I want? I believe. I want to be a follower. Figure out how to change. Figure out how to change. Okay. Remember, it, see, this is where we got it wrong. If you're convinced, you're convinced or not. You don't have to be convinced more, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's on or off. We have this thing because we have this health and welfare thing, and we've always translated these, mistranslated these words as belief. So if I don't have enough belief, if I don't have enough belief, there's something wrong with, with me, right? Or maybe there's something wrong with God. You notice in our culture that people want to blame who they want to blame. God. The church tells them they don't have enough belief. That's not true. It's either belief or not. But if you believe, if you have, if you are convinced, what does that make you want to know? How do I? Right? Mm -hmm. This is a question that the Romans wanted to know. Does it matter to me and what do I do about it? Right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus is teaching them. It's okay. Think, think, think. And the background of that thought is what? Torah. Torah. I don't have to change the rules. The rules are the same. The rules are the same. But for the Greeks, it's not just a question of Torah. What's the question? What's the real question? Remember in Romans? Does this God apply to me personally? Does this God apply personally to me and what do I do about it? Right? And what do I do about it? They're convinced that God applies to them because they're convinced, right? But what they want to know is, what do I do about it? What can I do about it? Jesus doesn't answer this question for them yet, but that's okay. So in 35, it says, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to them. This is a remote, literally, Eremos. It's a lonesome place, and it's already very late. So Jesus is teaching these people. Sin, literally, apule. Free them fully. In other words, send the people away. I don't know how to say this in Greek specifically, but it's it's free them. Um, release? Uh, release. But see, these people came on their own, their own, right? right. So, you know, this kind of... During the meeting? It's hard to do. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like getting people out of your house, right? These people came because they wanted to come. Tell them the symposium's over. It's over, right? Close the bar. <laughs> Close the bar. Close. Anyway, there are problems here because the, some people send them away, Apola, so they can go to the surrounding country and villages and buy something themselves, something to eat. But he answered, and literally, it's Apokrenomai. He he asked them to conclude for themselves. To them, for them to conclude for themselves, or, or he concluded for himself, and Epo, he said. So it's he concluded for himself, or asked them to conclude for themselves, you can read either way, and said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Now this is really interesting, because... You know, Greek is literal. So when he said, you give them something to eat, that literally in Greek means you feed them. However, Jesus has been providing something for them. All right? Think about this. Now, remember, Greek is concrete. And this is pretty concrete. They are at a lonesome place. And Jesus already said, or the author, Mark, said they are like quadrupeds, right? Living by their emotion. And so Jesus saw that they needed a shepherd. Now, it doesn't say that he became the shepherd. It just says they needed a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Leads them to a place to eat and drink. Okay? This can't be lost on anyone, right? Everyone, why else call it a shepherd and call them quadrupeds? So what has Jesus been feeding them this whole time? Well, we want to say spiritual food. He would probably say tsuke. He was teaching them, didaske. He was giving them yeah. thoughts. Okay? We like to say spiritual. We want to spiritualize it, and that's okay. But he, Jesus would have said, I'm giving them tsuke. I'm I'm. I am leading them in how, what to do about what this is about, right? So, the food he's talking about, I mean, obviously we're moving kind of a little bit of a euphemistic, figurative way here. Because when Jesus says that, 
He does what? He means do things. Number one, why are you guys sitting on your behinds and not and not teaching, right? And number two, why don't you guys go get some food? Or, and obviously this is a set. Amen, it's an obvious set. And they lego to him. They lego to him. It would take eight months of a men's wages. Are we to go out and spend li literally a gazora, which is go to the market. Are we to go out to the market and get that much bread, artos, uh, literally loaves, to give it to them to eat? And if you calculate this out, okay, you can calculate this out even before you get it. If you take, uh, and here's some really fun stuff. One denarii, okay, is silver. Our money is made of cheap yeah. junk metal. But in that day, they had silver. And it was silver. And one denarius was silver. They're very small. They're like a dime. I should have brought one. I think I've got one someplace. But a little denarius, a little tiny thing about a little bit smaller than a dime, thinner, very thin, and a denarius is equal to one person's wages for a day. And this was true for a long time. You know, there's no such thing as inflation when you have commodity-based currency. Did you know that? You cannot have inflation in a commodity-based uh, currency. So if your currency is based on gold or silver, it is impossible to have inflation because the value of that thing is worth a set value. So guess how long a denarius was worth one man's wages? About a thousand years. Uh -huh. A thousand years until the Romans started their own Federal Reserve System and then the Federal Reserve wage. System intentionally inflated the currency because they took away the value of the currency and began to devalue it and they had a, re a what we call a reserve-based currency and then that's what governments like to do is they inflate it because then your dollars are worth less. Our, our dollars are worth 3% less every year. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wouldn't you rather have denarius? If you had a denarius, you'd have silver. You could sell it if you wanted to. And usually the point with a denarius or with, with uh, currency in the ancient world is, is a, denar is a silver denarius worth more or less than its value? Mm -hmm. more. It's worth less. The silver, if you have a gold coin, the gold coin is always worth less by weight than its value. See? But the point is that the, the silver or gold has value in itself. So therefore, if the government decides to stop backing the currency, guess what you can do with it? You can sell it because it has value. Right? And, well, anyway. It's important to note this because I just I want you to know that the denarius and silver, you know, that is one person's wages. So we can calculate it out that we have either, if it's 200 days worth of wages, that means 2,000 to about 5,000 people. It depends on how much you consider that, that bread is worth, you know. So is, is one person's wages worth one bread or loaf or what, You're right? So approximately 5,000, 2,000 to 5,000 men, you can figure that out. Mark didn't need to count them. It was a measured by amount type thing. But we do find out later they do. In 38, how many artros, artos, 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 loaves of bread? Now, before we go any further, remember, we're talking about Greeks and we're talking about Greek gods. When we talk about loaves of bread, who are we talking about? What god? Goddess. God of the hardest. The goddess of the hardest is the mentor. The mentor is also the goddess of a very famous mysterion. The Minervan this mysterion. Alright? So you gotta remember this because it says he has loaves of bread. How many loaves of bread do you have? And then he argued, go and see. So he said, go and see. And they went out and see, and we said, we have five. We have, there's five loaves of bread. And in this account, the little boy doesn't come up. Okay, I think it's in Luke where the little boy comes up. But anyway. And they have two ichthus. Ichthus. Yeah. All right, now this is really important. Ichthyology. For a couple of reasons. An ichthus is a? Fish. Okay, what god or goddess? Poseidon. 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 
Okay? And also, what about ichthus? Ichthus is also It is the sign of the Christian mysterion. It's the sign of Teen Hodos. Teen Hodos. <laughs> you know, Mark is not going to let you off. Mark is not going to leave out Teen Hodos, okay? So, you know, I know this is a historical account. It is a historical account, okay? So however you want to play the game, is it a theological thing that mystically we get ichthus, Right? Pretty interesting, because ichthus, and I can't remember how you do it, but you basically rearrange the letters and you get, um, let's see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it, Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's a um, mnemonic. So I, in, in Latin, is the J. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christus, mnemonic, ichthus. I should have given it to you where is they. Ichthus, ich. Theta, uh, ichthus, I think it's this, and turn in sigma, ichthus. So, Christ, right? Jesus Christ, Theus, Son of God. Pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so, but remember, this is Greek. So the minute we talk about loaves and fishes, we're talking about Dementor and Poseidon. Jesus directed, epitasso, arranged them. This is where the epitasso is. So Jesus arranged them. Jesus arranged them. Now what's interesting about this is, remember, it says Paul writes that Jesus was hupitasso under God. So Jesus is epitasso. He is arranging them to have all the people anaclino Anaclino to Anaclino to recline to eat. Right. Recline to eat. Now, what do you think the disciples are thinking? <coughs> Where's the food? Where's the food? Yeah. Well, where's the food? Where's the, where's the beef? Yeah. Who is this guy? He just t he, he he arranged them. <coughs> I mean, this is like tables of eight, right? right. But there's We're no food. Something. Okay. So we got the tables of eight. But there's no food. So he's epitasso, and he asks them to recline to eat. All right. Well, this is pretty interesting. In symposiums, okay, I really is interesting that they translated this to be groups. He had them sit down in symposiums. And remember what I told you. In a symposium, you are... Discussion. While you're eating and drinking... And you are discussing philosophy. Suke. Right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus, Jesus is doing tables of eights, right? Mm -hmm. He's put these guys, he epitossed them into groups yeah. that are symposiums. And the word used specifically is symposiums. It doesn't say that he arranged them. I mean, there are there are Literally in the Greek, there's a whole lot of different words I can use for getting together. Sunago. Remember, Sunago was to lead. He could have. He could have Sunago them. He didn't Sunago them. He didn't lead them. He could have. Um, uh, it's like. Uh, um, he could have ecclesied them, called them, right? Like the Athenian democracy, ecclesia. He could have ecclesia, called them together, right? There are uh, probably about 10 words, and I, I did this before, a few classes, way, you know, a couple of years before, where I listed all the different words for gathering. Agora. Ag you know, he could have used all kinds of words, but he didn't. He used the word symposia. In fact, mine has it twice. Is that a misprint? Or is it says the group says symposia, symposia. It is repeated twice. Now, this is interesting because usually the King James and the NIVs will say companies of companies or groups of groups. I think the King James says companies of companies. Okay? Literally, it is symposia of symposia. I'm not sure how to take this because did he, did he group them? And I wasn't going to discuss this, but I'm, I'm glad you pointed this out, Dave. 
But you know, did he group them like in larger symposia with smaller groups that then share? Or did he did he group them in groups of symposia that then share? I don't I don't know. I can't answer. I wish you know, wouldn't it be great to be there to see what's going on here? I mean, th this is a very interesting circumstance. Whatever it was that whatever Jesus taught them, he wanted them to discuss it and think about it. Now this is Greek. This is completely Greek. Did Hebrews do this? Yeah. No way. No way. Hebrews do not do anything like this. This is totally non-Hebraic. What's interesting, though, is he, he put them in groups, symposium, on the chloros, and, and in the King James, I think the NIV says green grass. No, it's chloros, chortos. Chloros, chortos. The impression here is that, okay, anyone who knows the vegetation of the Middle East, especially in this area, because this is past the Eskedron, right? It's on the backside. So there's going to be what, what kind of patches? Like dirt, and then maybe some vegetation. And then some dirt, and then some vegetation. So obviously, what he did is he put them in the places where there's vegetation. Well, the, now the disciples, maybe they're thinking, is he going to feed them grass? grass? <laughs> right? I mean, look, the imagery is beautiful. He's already said they're like quadrupeds. You know, they're, think, they're not thinking, they're like sarks. And he sat and taught them because they need a shepherd. But you know what he didn't do? A shepherd would have sunago, right? A shepherd would have sunago, led the group together. Mm -hmm. Instead, he did what? Okay. He symposium them. <clears throat> Is there a leader in a symposium? There is never a leader in a symposium. There might be a person who um, facilitates. <coughs> keynote speaker? Well, but usually a keynote speaker is not part of the symposium itself, right? The keynote speaker is part of the, the meal. When you have the meal, you have the keynote speaker, right? And it's no longer a symposium because usually you don't stand up and say, well, I don't agree with that, right? But in the symposium, somebody gives a paper and you have some interaction with the group. Yeah, what are you saying? Oh, I've been in meetings where you have a keynote speaker, but then that keynote speaker has helpers like apostles. And they would group people around, and then each of the apostles or helpers would lead, help to lead the groups of people to discuss together. And he's trying to get his uh, disciples up off their butts and doing something. We already know that he told the disciples. He kind of gave them a backhand, right? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Feed them, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I don't know about this. Anyway, it, it's pretty, yeah. But anyway, it's really interesting the words that are used, specific words that are used, because this gives us the impression that the whole place is a pastor. It's like Heidi, right? It's like being up in the Swiss Alps. It is not like being in the Swiss Alps. Go, go to the Holy Land and see what this is like. You're not going to find... It's more like Kansas vegetation, you know, except with, without the high grass. So they ate, or so they sat. They, Anna's people, they fell back, they reclined down in Prasia in rows of hundreds and fifties. So I've got that broken down. It's repeated for us also. Mm -hmm. So was this hundreds, uh, hundreds and fifties of hundreds and fifties? Could be. It's hard to tell. That's, that's the impression that's given. But the real important thing is the symposium thing. I think this is really beautiful. Then taking the five loaves and taking the five artos and the two ichthus and looking up to heaven. So I looked up to Aronis. He gave eulego. He spoke well of. He gave good words, good, good argument. And catecleo, he broke down. Catecleo. Catecleo, it's right here. Catecleo. Catechleo, he divided the loaves. <coughs> then he also gave them to his disciples to parathemi, to place alongside the people. Okay, so first, first he begins dividing them. <coughs> then he hands them to his disciples. And then the disciples hand them to the people. And he also divided, he literally merizo, merizo, that's why I put this word, merizo, 
He parted the two fishes. The point is, I wanted to make is, these are not like special Greek words. That's why I gave you so many. Th these are really not surprising Greek words. I mean, these are really, you know, very simplistic in their, <coughs> in their, um, in their points, right? Straightforward every day. Jesus is going to give him a drinking party. He looks up into the skies. He says something. You know, it's not a Eucharisto. It's not a Eucharisto. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a good prayer, right? Mm -hmm. He gives a you. Logos, a good argument or good words, right? In the beginning, and then begins to break them. Now what is very important about this, there is something very important about this, because this looks like something to the Hebrews, and it also looks like something to the Greeks. Anybody know what it looks like? Looks like sorcery. This is following the rules of magic. Remember the rules of magic? If I take, I could, you know, literally <coughs> under the rules of magic with the proper spells, I could take something and break it up, right? Mark is very cautious to use very, very non religious terms. Why do you think he used the word symposium? Instead of sunago. Sunago is also the same word as the synagogue. He wanted to separate this completely from the idea that Jesus is doing what? Sorcery. He is, he is ensuring that his Greek audience does not get the wrong point. So he uses words that are very simple in the Greek, very specific. And we'll continue from there, from there next week. But the point I want you to get from this is, you know, this is, this is not exactly what it seems. You know, in the sense of, yeah, it's feeding 5,000, right? Yeah. But there is a lot in here. The depth that Mark is trying to get us to understand and see, and the depth of the words that are used, really puts it into a, an interesting circumstance, both for teaching the disciples for these people. And remember, the point of this is the result of the priestess, of the persuasion, the result of the priestess. Compare this to Matthew, I think Matthew or John in the feeding of the 5,000, or Luke, and see what that, what the result of that is, and you'll see the huge difference between the two. We'll get to that next week. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you can be a look after us this week. In the name we pray. Amen.